Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. I've got an incredible podcast for you today. My guests on the podcast today were with us last year, and they shared their incredible story about how they're profiting $15,000 a month on their rental properties. And Casey, tell me if I got this right. You guys sold one of your properties and you used the equity that you made on that sale to buy another property. And that new property is generating you another $15,000 a month in profit. Yeah, we took a property that was generating about $1,500 a month in cash flow and 10x that money into $15,000 a month with just one one transaction. When I hear a story like this, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, this person must be a really sophisticated investor or they came from a lot of money or they had some kind of advantage. But you guys are just regular people. Yeah, Dan, we love to share our story. It's been fun. We're just normal, everyday people, blue collar you know, work hardworking people that make a great team. I, you know, between my wife and I, we've been able to do a lot of things and not hasn't been handed to us. And it, we don't come from some real estate moguls or inherited money. It's it's all done through just hard work and teamwork. And you're really not doing anything crazy to find deals, right? We find our deals through normal networking and on the MLS. On the podcast today, we're going to figure out how this deal worked out. We'll talk about the property that they sold, which was how they got the money to buy the new property. We'll take a look at what they bought and we'll go over all the numbers, including what they paid for it. We'll look at what their gross rents are. We'll figure out what all their expenses are and how they're getting to $15,000 a month in profit. Joining us on the show today from Lexington, Kentucky is Casey and Casey Massey. We'll take a real quick break to thank our sponsors. We'll come right back and we'll jump right into the interview. It's a lot of work to find a really good rental property. And when you actually find that property, you want to make sure you're working with a lender that can get that loan closed. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's a nationwide lender, and her specialty is helping investors finance rental properties. She has a ton of loan programs, and she can find something customized to you for your situation. If you want to find out more or you're ready to get started today, just go to RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com, NMLS 42056. Rental Income Podcast. For anyone that maybe didn't hear your first appearance last year, why don't we start off with you telling us about what your rental portfolio looked like last year? So we had about 50 units last year and we were bringing in cash flow about $15,000 a month. Okay, so your gross rent was about 40000 a month, and after you paid all your mortgages, taxes, insurance, repairs, you were netting 15000 a month. Yeah, that's, that's pretty close. Yeah. And how, how are you guys splitting up the workload? Um, I take the property management side. I do screening, rent collection, showings, um, maintenance requests, anything in between. Okay. She does 90% of the work. I do 10. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Casey, in addition to like, you were finding deals and kind of doing the figuring out the financing and all that. And you also have a full-time job, right? Are you still working full-time? So it's a sales job. It's a 1099 sales job, but I've done that for 13 years and it's been, we've been able to use all that, the earnings we made from, from my normal job because my wife has been, you know, quote unquote, a stay at home mom, but we use the income to purchase real estate so that we can gain that financial freedom. So that's always been our goal. Awesome. Okay. All right. So you guys were already just doing awesome last year, making 15000 a month in rental income, but you have basically doubled that here in the last year. Yeah, just right. over doubled it. Yeah. Incredible. Um, so l let's talk about this. So you bought a new property. Tell me about the property you bought. So it's something we never thought would be possible because you expect like large corporations and place, you know, companies to buy apartments, but we were able to secure two 30 unit buildings that were right next to each other that totaled, uh, I think 65 units combined. Um, 
just this last year. Wow. Okay. So you, you more than doubled your, your entire portfolio on one purchase. Yeah. Then we purchased them together. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So were you guys like a little bit nervous? I mean, to go from your portfolio before, you know, where you guys seem to have a good handle on everything and to add that many units, did that seem intimidating? Extremely. Yeah. When I went and looked at it, I was looking at it with a few different like doctors and kind of some bigger time investors. And I just felt out of place. I looked like a contractor, you know, in my my janitor janitor key belt with all my keys on it and I'm walking through and nobody really knew why I was there but um, I just wanted to look just because I knew if I never look at the deals if I always said that that's not possible then it's never going to be possible so I right. went I went to look just to look how did you and find the property it was on LoopNet. okay so you were just online looking around and you came across it went over and checked it out yeah, I, I have uh, email alerts turned on for both LoopNet and uh, Zillow. So any multifamily things that get listed, I get an email. And Casey, were you nervous at all of, about adding on that many units? Because you're going to have to manage these properties. Right. I was extremely nervous. I think I told him multiple times not to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you guys did it. Was the property, like what kind of condition was it in? It, it was pretty good condition. They had the previous owner had owned it for five years or so, and they had been doing a bunch of good. There was not really deferred maintenance. We'll say they they updated units as they needed it, and um, and we just kind of felt we could take it even further from what they had done with it. Was it fully occupied? It was. I think all of them, but two, one or two. Okay, so one one was one of the units they had been using as an office. So. That that right there, we knew we could generate you know about eight thousand more a year just from renting that unit, and then uh, we because we wouldn't need an on site manager, we would do everything from from home. Okay, so they they the previous owners had a, like a manager that lived at the property. Not lived; it was an office. So oh uh, like, right, okay, the, okay, yeah. So he was on site from like nine to five, and. He told us, we, my wife asked him, like, how much time do you think you put into work each week? And he said, well, about 40 hours. And so that was like, what are we doing? Like, we can't <laughs> handle 40 hours. We're going to have to figure out how to be more efficient than this. Yeah. So uh, it, it takes about, I would say, eight hours a week from we've been able to, to put towards it. Awesome. All right. Well, let's, um, l- let's take a look at some numbers on, on this building. How much did you pay for it? Four point two five million, and wow. I never thought that I would be able to buy something that big. That is a lot of money. And yeah. how much rent does it bring in every month? Now, after you know six months of owning it, it brings in just uh, it brings in forty nine thousand. Just forty nine thousand. Okay, so I mean that's th- those are big numbers, but like you're right at the one percent rule, which you know is a a good deal, but it, it's not like this is a a crazy deal. It's it just you're looking at just bigger numbers. Instead of looking at a hundred thousand dollar property, you're looking at a four million dollar property. The two things that I look at mainly is cash on cash return and cash flow. Right. Okay. Okay. So now when we look at your expenses on on the property, you know, your mortgage payment, your taxes, insurance, like how much does that all come out to every month? On this building, between the two units combined, we spend about thirty-one thousand a month towards like um, property tax, property tax, mortgage, um, utilities that we cover, all that. Okay, so that leaves you eighteen thousand dollars. And then, how are you dealing with budgeting for repairs or vacancy? One of the buildings is an HOA situation where we own the HOA. So we, we budget naturally $150 each month from, or from each unit goes towards the HOA account, which we took over when we purchased. And uh, so that goes to any exterior or system repairs for the building. And then uh, the other building, we just kind of budget about the same in our head, um, about $150 a unit. So Okay. So, so after everything... That like so out of that eighteen thousand dollars a month after your fixed expenses, it's about three thousand a month. Yeah, I mean that's the real like we if you average in the repairs we've done, most units have been turned and repaired already and updated. But we 
we plan for some months or a little bit more. Some months we have very little expenses minus, you know, mowing and we do some pest control. So um, it's average about 3000 a month for repairs so far. Now, that, that doesn't sound like a lot, um, you know, w- with that many that many units like and I and how long have have you guys owned the property for? Since October okay. of last year. OK, so so, you know, I realize that it hasn't been a long time, but but like in actuality, is that a, about what the expenses have been? Yeah, we've only had to update like, you know, less than probably four bathrooms. And I think we've done flooring in one of them. Most of them had already been done and may, maybe paint. There's they're one bedroom, one bathroom apartments downtown um, Lexington. And so it's a lot of younger people, single people, and then some like single older people and maybe some young couples. So it's it's not a big space. So when we do turn one, it's not very expensive. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so so you you've got to paint or replace flooring or something. So because they're so small, that that's a big part of why the 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 amount that you have budgeted is is so low. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the money. So you've got a four point two million dollar building. The down payment on that. I would assume is a lot of money. How much of a down payment did you need to buy a building like that? So when I initially looked at it, I, I, I knew when I ran numbers before I even saw it, I was, I knew I wasn't going to be able to come up with 800 or 900,000. Cause that's what I was used to doing 20%, sometimes even 25%. And so I had kind of ruled out the property in my mind, but when I went and looked at it, the owner was actually the, the realtor on it. And so I just worked directly with him and he told me to reach out to their lender and that they might be able to do something unique for us because they didn't want to get the loan paid off. They wanted to keep it in their in their books. They didn't want to get uh, try to lend that money back out quickly. So so I was able to not take over the loan, but keep them as the financer on the property or, or finance their mortgage holder. And they they let us do 10 percent down. And we took the property that we never thought we would sell, a home that we loved and lived in for five years. We sold the property out in uh, out west, and we took the appreciation and used that as the down payment for this apartment building. Okay, so all right, so how much of a down payment did you actually need? So it was four hundred twenty-five thousand. Four twenty-five. Okay. So now the house that you sold, I mean, so you had $425,000 equity in that property? Yeah, we had close to $600,000 in equity on it after we bought it. And we remodeled it five years ago and and did an extensive remodel because we lived there and we wanted it to be nice. So it was about a $100,000 remodel. We bought it for $390,000. We thought it might be worth $750,000 after we did everything. So we were all in about $500,000. We thought it might be worth seven fifty, but then when COVID hit and all this, the houses appreciated so much, we were able to sell it for almost a million nine hundred ninety five thousand. So, <laughs> all right, let, let me walk this. This is incredible. All right, so you bought the property for three ninety. How, how long ago did you buy it? Twenty sixteen. Okay, so you bought it for three ninety, and was this house in bad shape when you bought it? It had been remodeled by the previous owner, but they just did a really bad job. I think he did most of it himself. And so it was a 6,000 square foot home that just needed to be redone again. Okay. So so you were all in for how much with, with the purchase and the remodel? How much did that come out to? 500,000. 500,000. And then you sold it for how much? 995. 995. Incredible. And, and that was just basically the market appreciation that we've seen over the last couple of years that that's what what got you there yeah when we look we don't typically have to get grand slams or home runs but it was in a good area when we bought it and we saw the potential in it and never did we think it would lead to buying a four million dollar apartment obviously when we bought it it was for us to live in but we utilized all the things that had kind of fallen into place and it wasn't and you can say luck or not but it's just being exposed to real estate, usually if your if your numbers look good, it, it works in your favor. Yeah, I mean that that's the thing is 
like you probably had no idea when you bought that property that one day it would be worth a million dollars. Did you? No, no, never. Yeah. So it's like, you, you just got to take steps and like, you, you don't always know what's going to happen, but you, you know, it's like if you had made a plan several years ago that you were going to buy this house and you were going to sell it for a million dollars and then take that equity and buy an apartment building, like people would have thought you were crazy. Oh, they still think we're crazy. People, <laughs> they talk to us all day long, like, what are you doing? Like, how do you, how are you not worn out? And we do work a lot. I mean, this, we initially started real estate because we wanted it to be passive, but it's become everything but passive, but that's because we love to do it and we love our tenants and we, we like to have that communication with them. So my wife has been able to do things that I never thought possible and handle the load that, you know, most companies might struggle with, but she does it all by herself. Right. So Casey, did you mind selling this property, selling your house? Um, initially when he mentioned it to me, I said, absolutely not. Um, that was my dream home. It was the perfect layout and we designed it to be for us. But, um, as reality kind of set in, I, I just don't see us going back that way right now. And with the market where it was, it just made sense, you know? Yeah. So I fought it for a little while and, um, we kept talking about it and we kept talking numbers and, Eventually, it just kind of made sense to do it. It, it was it was heartbreaking, you know. Yeah. We we got to stay a week in the house before we sold it and packed up everything, and um, our kids got to be there with us. And it, it was it was amazing, but it was, we were ready to move on at that point. You know, it it almost it, it almost wouldn't make sense to keep that property w- with that much equity in there. You know, because you you said you you were making fifteen hundred dollars a month on that property after all your expenses, right? Yeah, it's funny you mention that because I we had tried to do a refinance, like a cash out refinance to do the Burr strategy with this property. So we thought, hey, if we pull out all of our equity between our down payment and uh, repairs, we can you know be cash flowing still and so and then use that 200,000 in equity. I think that's the most I could pull out without going into jumbo loan status. So I had tried to do that about a year ago. And the day I was supposed to get the money and close, they canceled my loan because they they saw that I was living in Kentucky and they just they saw a Facebook post that I had made about moving to Kentucky because we we at the time were when we talked last we were splitting time we would spend part of the year in Utah part of the time in Kentucky and it just with our family growing we have two kids and one on the way it didn't make sense to go back and forth like that so I wonder you know refinance and then kind of not beat the system but rent it when we weren't there and then my refinance was canceled and I was super frustrated because it was preventing me from kind of using that equity, but it was a silver lining. You know, the next year we ended up selling it and had even more equity and I probably wouldn't have sold it because I wouldn't have had this other deal. I got under contract with the apartment building before we had even figured out where the money was going to come from. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about that. Cause I was just thinking that, so you got the apartment building, and you've got to sell this house. So like, so the seller of the apartment building was comfortable putting the house under contract when you didn't really have a source of that income or you didn't really have that income until the house sold for a million dollars. Right. Yeah. So I didn't have the money sitting there. Yeah, so right. you know, I got under contract. I just kept reassuring the seller who was also the realtor that I was going through. He just did the whole deal. And I just told him, like, we'll make it happen. Like, I've never not been able to close on something. Like, we'll figure it out. So I put the closing date, like, three months out, gave me some time to figure out what I wanted to do, whether it was try to refinance again or sell some other properties. And so every time we kept coming back to it, it was like, we just need to sell this Utah property because we we moved from Utah to Kentucky so we could be take care of our manage manage our properties on site, like be close by. And the year we moved, we had a massive basement flood. Um, Luckily, having good insurance covered our basement flood and remodel that needed to be done. But then when we were living in Kentucky, we had to manage this remodel from Kentucky. So it was kind of a headache. Not really. I mean, it was kind of a nightmare, too. We had to move our tenants out, um, redo the whole basement. Uh, We had tenants in the basement, tenants in the main floor of the home. It was a dual... It was a dual property, had a, an a, ADU, accessory dwelling unit, I think that is. Um, but yeah, so 
we got the remodel done and we looked at the property. It was like perfect. The landscaping had redone, been redone. The basement was brand new. We put new tenants in the basement and the upstairs tenants had just bought a house and moved out. So we, the stars kind of aligned, I guess you'd say like it just, the timing seemed like we needed to sell that house. Has it, has it made a huge difference? I mean, to go from 15,000 a month in cash flow to over $30,000 in cash flow, ha- has that like how how much of a difference has that made in your life? Like, do you really feel it, or at, at that level, is it is it just something you don't even notice anymore? To be honest, I don't really feel any different. Um, it is nice to know that if something big happened, um, we have the reserve to take care of it. But you know, yeah. we're not dressing any fancier or living any larger because of it, right? So, all right, so so that. That brings up an interesting point then. So is there a certain amount of money that you guys want to get to every month? Like, so if making $30,000 a month isn't that much different than making $15,000 a month, like why get to 30? I think that's a great question. Um, My wife and I talk about this a lot because it's like, when do you stop or what do you do you scale? Do you change? You know, I know I know some people that have got to this point and then they sell everything and do something completely different. We enjoy it. So as long as it makes us happy, we're going to do it. And we were sitting at the park today eating Taco Bell. You know, we still eat cheap. We still, you know, we don't finance our vehicles. You know, there's nothing like crazy expenses that we do. We might do a, a remodel on our kitchen here. We did buy a, a big playground, bought a three thousand dollar playground for our son because he was sad when we sold our Utah house. So we we made a deal with him that we would buy him a playground for the backyard. So there's some things that we've done, but it's not it's we're not living any different. I guess you'd say it's just more work for us, and we enjoy it. And if a good deal comes up, like we bought a fourplex this year earlier this year that was for sale by owner and. We, we were able to use the extra cash that we had and we did a cash purchase. So we got a good deal on it. And then we did a burr on it without having to do any remodeling. It was actually just worth enough after the appraisal. So there's things we still are buying property, but it's got to be a pretty good deal, I guess you'd say. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I'm just, we're not forcing any deals at this point. Yeah, you guys are on the right track. It sounds like you're doing all the right things. The key to financial success is actually really simple. And everyone, I think, knows this inherently, but it's good to hear. It's really all about living below your means. So if you make $30,000 a month and you spend $30,000 a month, you're going to feel broke. Where if you make $30,000 a month, but you only spend $10,000 a month, you've got a lot of margin in your life. You've got $20,000 that you can used to pay down debt or do more investing or just put in the bank. It's a whole different feeling when you have money left over at the end of the month versus being broke at the end of the month. And this works at any income level. If you make $5,000 a month and you spend $5,000 a month, you're always going to feel broke. Where if you earn $5,000 a month, but you spend $4,000 a month, and you've got an extra thousand dollars a month to to put away or to invest, you're gonna you're gonna feel rich. So that that's really the key. You just need to to live below your means. Like that that is really the key to financial success. Well, if anybody wants to hear more from Casey and Casey, their first interview was on June 29th, 2021. It was episode number 321. And you can go back and look that up on whatever podcast app you're listening to. I'd like to thank our sponsor for making this episode possible. It's Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. Chaley is a nationwide lender, and her specialty is helping investors finance rental properties. She has a ton of different loan programs, including her no-doc loan, where she doesn't need bank statements, pay stubs, or tax returns. All she needs is a good deal. If you find a great deal, she will give you a 30-year fixed rate loan. Now, the rates are going to be a little bit higher than a full doc loan, but it's super easy. If you want more details or if you want to set up a time to talk to Chaley personally, just go to RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com, NMLS 42056. 
Thank you so much for checking out the podcast today. Make sure you hit that follow button and you will get notified as soon as the next episode comes out. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.